Okay, good evening, everyone. We are live and right on time. Um, we had a lot of people to register for this, and I know you all came to see Dr. Tisdale, so I'm not going to talk long, um, but thank you for tuning in to our Critical Conversations webinar series. And um, I'm gonna do this one a little bit differently. I'm not going to read a bio um, because Dr. Tisdale and I go way, way back. Um, I think that for at least 15 years, Dr. Tisdale was a household name because I just always heard his name and I heard that he was the one that was going to find a cure for sickle cell disease. And I remember when I pursued my own journey to have sickle cell cured, uh, things got super, super dicey. And I was actually at Johns Hopkins, but my mother was so overwhelmed and some kind of way she was able to track down Dr. Tisdale. So it means a lot to me that he's here. Um, Dr. Tisdale, the last time I saw you, we were sitting in the cafeteria at NIH and we were anticipating these approvals. So I'm going to let you give opening remarks and say what you want to say. And then we're going to get into your presentation and come back for Q&A from the audience. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's an honor uh, to be here to present in this forum and you know to be a friend and a partner of yours in this effort to um to try to do something about this disease and you know we we have been at it for a while what, what she didn't tell you is that we've also published some together um, including transplantation guidelines to the american society of hematology we we're on a committee together going through grade classifications with the mayo clinic people uh, trying to come up with recommendations for, you know, bone marrow transplants where there aren't a lot of data. And, um, you know, we did the best we could and we made some observations from registry data too. And, um, you know, we've continued to partner in trying to, you know, make differences. Um, and, um, you know, I really admire your efforts in, in addressing, you know, a big problem with transplantation and that is, uh, the infertility that we see after self-in conditioning. So here we are. Uh, we had a little bit of a technical glitch, but we got here early enough to chat and uh, send the slides over. Somehow I need uh, administrator privileges to um, share on this platform and they've all gone home for the day. So I'm going to be talking about whether we are actually improving outcomes um, with individuals with sickle cell disease uh, through, through the recent efforts. So next. So this is a slide I made not too many years ago, which is already out of date. And these you are well aware of the strategies that we use to treat sickle cell disease. Current being drug treatment like hydroxyurea and hydroxyurea works by reactivating the kind of hemoglobin that we had in utero called fetal hemoglobin. And that's why babies with sickle cell disease are born well because they still have this fetal hemoglobin. But in the first six months of life that gets switched off in adult hemoglobin gets switched on. And for people who inherit sickle cell disease, that's hemoglobin sickle. So that's when the difficulties start. And so we have drugs like hydroxyurea that can turn back the clock a little bit and get cells to make fetal hemoglobin, get them through the circulation without sickling, and then hopefully reduce pain episodes, you know, uh, organ damage and the like. We also have next allogeneic transplantation. If we've known since the 80s that we can do a bone marrow transplant in somebody with sickle cell disease with bone marrow from a matching family member that doesn't have sickle cell disease, and we can replace the bone marrow uh, with one that makes normal red blood cells and then have you know, a cure of the disease. And what we've been working on beyond the dotted line here is what we call ex vivo gene therapy. So, you know, currently what we do <coughs> is take the patient's own bone marrow cells and try to fix them instead of giving them somebody else's bone marrow cells. And the way we try to fix them are two different ways now. One is to add the correctly spelled gene that was misspelled to cause um, hemoglobin sickle. 
Uh, and we can do that with viruses that we sort of, you know, hijack to make into uh, a Trojan horse, which I'll show you, uh, to carry that gene. Or now we have these fancy tools, you know, called CRISPR and the like that can cut genes wherever we want. And so we can cut that gene that turns off fetal hemoglobin at birth and have it come back on. So that's another really robust strategy. And now this, this dotted line has to be moved over because these two, gene addition and gene editing, uh, were just FDA approved uh, in December of last year. And finally, we have to work on ways to do this in vivo. So we're trying to think of ways where if we can do this in a flask, then maybe we can do this in the body where we just squirt those things that are in that circle there uh, instead into uh, the vein and have them find the bone marrow and do the gene addition or the gene editing. And, you know, it sounds like science fiction now, but, but, but so did gene addition and gene editing not too long ago. So I think we will eventually get there, uh, but it's going to take, you know, a lot more effort. We have a lot of the pieces in place. And in fact, one liver disease has already been uh, cured by uh, in vivo gene editing. So next. So this is how gene addition works. This is a kind of gene therapy that's been around for the longest. Um, and most people call this gene therapy. Uh, and that is that we use a viral vector that we take the bad stuff out of. And um, we've used a bunch of different viruses over the years from the mouse, uh, uh, other viruses uh, that infect humans. But it turns out the one that works best is um, to use a portion of HIV in combination with a portion of vesicular stomatitis virus that causes ulcers in the mouth and a portion of cytomegalovirus that, that causes uh, mono mostly in humans. We put those together to, to be like this Trojan horse and we can add the gene to bone marrow stem cells uh, and hope that we do it efficiently enough that we have an overpowering of the sickle hemoglobin by the new hemoglobin that this viral vector brings. Next. As I said, this became possible when we switched to HIV, and these are two papers that showed these landmark discoveries by M Michel Satellane and by uh, Philippe Labouche uh, in mouse models showing that we can finally uh, fix the disease in thalassemia and in two different transgenic mouse models of sickle cell disease. So this was big news, and that's why these are in, you know, big journals, um, uh, Nature and, and Science, because it was a, such a, a big breakthrough. Next. So about this time, we had been working to bridge that gap um, with, with large animal models, and we had evidence that we could make this happen in humans at the level that we needed um, which is 20%. We knew from bone marrow transplants for brothers or sisters that we only have to fix one in five cells to fix the disease, one in five bone marrow stem cells or seeds of the bone marrow. And we had gotten to that point in both small and large animal models that are much more predictive of what we do in humans. So we launched a collaboration. This was in 2014 with Bluebird Bio, which was a young company then, only 10 people, uh, to, um, to uh, do a first in human uh, clinical trial. And we learned some things along the way. For example, in group A, we used bone marrow. We didn't settle the patient down with transfusions uh, and we didn't um, optimize, we hadn't um, optimized the percentage of cells that get the gene. We had to do further work because in group A, we saw only a modest improvement uh, in the hemoglobin. So we moved to group B where we required transfusions beforehand. We were still using bone marrow, but we started collecting backup with plorexophore mobilization because we thought that might be a safe and effective way to get bone marrow stem cells instead of doing a bone marrow harvest, which is kind of a pain for both the patient and the doctor. It's a lot of work. and. It's a lot of recovery. Uh, and we improved the way we put the gene in to get a higher fraction of those cells having the gene. And then so finally in group C, we moved to doing everything with mobilized peripheral blood because we were getting a bunch of cells uh, from the patients in this way. Um, and with the you know improved transduction and, and, and mobilized uh, blood as the source. Uh, so the way it works is a patient 
gets these cells collected. They go to a central lab where the, the gene is added, the cells are frozen, then we make sure everything went fine. If so, we bring the patient back and we have to give something to clear out their leftover marrow. So for now, that's busulfan, which is um, chemotherapy, which is pretty difficult actually, but it's, it's what we have at the moment and we're also trying to improve on that. And then we give the cells back and they grow up and hopefully make enough red cells to outcompete the sickle cells and, and, and fix the disease. So next. We saw a drop um, in, in the vector copy number. So how much um, vector is in, in the patient? It's not showing here, but uh, suffice it to say it, it fell about tenfold. So it was a, about one in the product, which means that 100% of the cells got about a one copy of the gene but it dropped to 0.1. So that means that 10% of cells have one copy of the gene. And I said, we need 20. And that's what we saw here. So in pink, you can see the amount of hemoglobin coming from what we did, the gene therapy. And it's only a gram or two. And you can see the total hemoglobins are not normal. Uh, and in fact, the patients were having uh, still episodes of pain while fewer still having pain. So next. Alexis went back and looked at bone marrow and found out that the bone marrow actually didn't have as pure of, um, of the seeds that we're looking for. Um, you see non-sickle cell disease marrow in the left column has almost all of those cells are CD34 bright, what we look for in bone marrow stem cells. But only about half of them in bone marrow from sickle, sickle cell disease participants had that CD34 bright. And that's because these cells are working overtime to try and compensate for the anemia. So a lot of these cells are, are not stem cells anymore. They're just being overworked. So that meant that less than half of the cells that we thought were stem cells weren't. Next. So we did mobilization with Plorexifor. And what you can see in the top left panel is that we get a boatload of these cells in the blood when we do that much more than we do in normals. And again, that's probably because the bone marrow is revved up in sickle cell disease trying to compensate. Uh, and instead of getting a couple of million per kg, we get like 5 million per kg, which is you know, more than what we would need uh, to do a, a gene therapy. And you know, the bottom left shows that um, you see this a cluster of cells at the, at the third column, almost 100% CD34 bright compared to the two columns on the, on, the, on the left showing only about half. So these cells are not only more, but they look better. Next. We did the same thing on the Bluebird trial, collecting backup. And the other important thing that we noted is, 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 is at the bottom. You know, we, we got the same amount of cells, a bunch of cells. We could repeat. They were mostly bright. They look like good stem cells. But when we were doing bone marrow harvests, uh, more than half of patients had pain that kept them in the hospital. Whereas when we did plorexifor uh, mobilization, only about a quarter of patients had pain that kept them in the hospital. So we got more cells, we got better cells, and we had less pain crises around the time of collecting them. Okay, so next. Then we looked at ways to, to get more of the gene into those bone marrow cells. And suffice it to say, we could, we could put as many copies of the correctly spelled gene as we wanted with these conditions. Uh, if you see at the bottom uh, where it says percent GFP, that's almost 100%. Uh, GFP intensity, it's really bright. This is a marker gene. It's actually a fluorescence protein that makes the jellyfish glow. So we use it a lot just to test our vectors to see if they can transfer that fluorescent gene. And um, vector copy number, which is the number of copies of the gene that we put in, is nearly 15 in the best conditions. And so we're limited, we limit ourselves to five in the clinical setting because we think that's a safe number. So we really made a lot of progress in being able to um, put this Trojan horse into the bone marrow cells at a high number, enough to make a lot of hemoglobin. Next. Well, that's funny. These things aren't showing up, the lines. Um, but, uh, oh, well, it's one of our glitches uh, from 
uh, <laughs> from this. Uh, l let me just explain what it would have shown, and that is that on the left, you would have seen vector copy number of 0.1, like I said, which means like 10% of the cells have a copy. But on the right, it was one and a half. Um, so in group C, we had almost, you know, we, we had all the cells containing a copy of the gene on average, um, meaning that, you know, this should uh, make a patient like sickle cell trait. Next. And we've published these two um, uh, updates on the protocol. First on the left is groups A and B, and on the right is group C. So there are lots of details uh, in here. If anyone wants a, a copy of these, uh, I can send them to you next. And we had an extension phase um, so that we could gather data for the FDA. So that, you know there were 47 patients, mostly adults, 10 adolescents, um, mostly with hemoglobin SS, mostly with a lot of pain uh, crises that um, um, bring them to the hospital three and a half times a year on average, some with a history of stroke uh, and baseline hemoglobin at eight and a half. And um, we got uh, uh, most of the, you know, 40, uh, 40 of them with uh, prior hydroxyurea use. So 85%. Next. So uh, I'll show you data from the efficacy analysis um, on, the, on the left here of the 47 patients who underwent transplantation. It's worth noting that the median follow-up was three years. The overall uh, exposure was 126 years and the longest follow-up was five years. Next. Uh, so we got lots of cells. We did two mobilization cycles had six and a half million CD34s per kg. Um, and we had a really good vector copy number as before. So uh, greater than one on average. Um, and about 80% of the cells uh, with the vector is shown in the bottom of the table here. Next. And this is the part uh, that's most satisfying. 88% of the patients achieved complete resolution of all vaso-occlusive events and 100% of the adolescent patients. And I think that's uh, partly because in adults, the pain uh, tends to be more chronic, uh, take longer uh, to go away, and sometimes irreversible when there are things like avascular and necrosis uh, that have set in already. Next. And this shows that 94% had complete resolution of severe VOE. So these are the um, defined in this protocol and many as uh, you know pain events that require hospitalization. Next. These are patient reported outcome measures um, uh, from the PROMISE 57 form. So these are um, filled out uh, not by us, but uh, by the patient. And you can see that over time, pain intensity, pain interference and fatigue all go down uh, in the correct uh, direction. Next. Here we see hemoglobin. So baseline you see around eight and you see the, the, the hemoglobins go to about 12. Uh, and shaded in blue is the um, amount coming from vector. So gray is hemoglobin S and blue is hemoglobin A from vector. So this looks about like a sickle cell trait would look uh, if you did electrophoresis on somebody with, with the carrier state. One point also worth noting, we weren't following stroke. And in fact, uh, Bluebird and, and, and Vertex both um, began to eliminate prior stroke for, um, for the clinical trial because of worries about bleeding. Uh, but we did transplant six individuals early on and um, uh, that had had a stroke as an indication and there were no strokes uh, after treatment. Next. So one of the big problems in sickle cell disease is that red cells break in the circulation and reticulocytes have to try to replenish them so they're high in the blood. Uh, bilirubin is inside blood cells. When blood cells break, that's also very high, as is LDH. So those are uh, things that we measure um, when we're looking at severity of disease. And sometimes you 
you can even see because the bilirubin can sometimes be high enough uh, for the eyes to yellow. Uh, and you can see that um, all of these um, went to the normal range. Next. Uh, this is a summary of the safety uh, in the transplant population. So this is a bone marrow transplant. Um, I have some patients who come to the clinical center and they're interested in gene therapy. So I start talking about transplant and they say, no, 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 I don't want a transplant. I want gene therapy, right? But it is a transplant. It's just a transplant uh, of your own cells. Uh, and these are the kinds of things that we see with a transplant of your own cells with busulfan uh, conditioning. Um, uh, most of these are related to busulfan. We did have one uh, patient who died, unfortunately, uh, in the second year after transplant from, um, from a pre-existing uh, heart condition uh, that was brought on by sickle cell disease and was not reversed uh, by the transplant. As I say, some complications of the disease, like avascular necrosis that I mentioned earlier, uh, we don't expect to change uh, after any sort of transplant. Uh, next. Uh, Alexis Leonard and my group uh, was responding to one of the questions that the FDA was asking, and that is like, how does this compare to a regular transplant from somebody else? So if you get a bone marrow transplant from a brother or sister, does pain go away? And actually no one had studied that. Everyone just assumes that after a regular bone marrow transplant, pain goes away. So here you can see in this, in this graph on the left, the number of pain events before the transplant, an allo transplant from a brother or sister, uh, as, as many as 50 in some of these people uh, over the two years prior. And in yellow, you can see in the first year after. So some patients are still having pain crises going back to the hospital up to 10 in that first year. Uh, but in the second year, uh, shown in red, there's almost none. So again, it takes some time uh, for pain to go away. Next. Well, we have other ways to do this. I told you we have CRISPR to cut genes. And, you know, we've had the human genome sequenced, and we can look at genes to see what genes affect what. And my colleague Sfile Thien here, when she was at uh, King's College London, uh, found a gene on genome-wide association studies that tracks with fetal hemoglobin. So people, when they have changes in this gene, have higher fetal hemoglobins. So many of us thought, well, maybe this gene is the switch that switches off fetal. And if that's the case, can we use these fancy new tools like CRISPR to cut that gene and make fetal turn on? So next. Well, it turns out we can, and these are just some data from my friend uh, Dan Bauer uh, that shows that um, if you if you cut the gene in red here in these red boxes, or a place in the gene that we think might be just uh, an erythroid enhancer, so something present only in red cells when they're developing, uh, you can get a lot of fetal hemoglobin uh, to turn on in cultured cells. So this looks like maybe a way to go. Maybe we don't have to add a gene at all. We could just cut this gene that turns off fetal hemoglobin, and then fetal will turn back on, sickle will turn down reciprocally, and we can fix the disease. And we know this should work because there are people who are born with sickle cell disease and changes in this or other genes that make fetal stay on, and they're fine. They have fetal hemoglobin. They don't have much sickle, and they have enough fetal to keep the sickle from sickling. So the question is, can we do what nature's already done in some on purpose and make this disease uh, go away? So next. So there's been one study looking at using a, a, a vector like this Trojan horse to turn it off because you can make that vector uh, turn that gene off by uh, making an inhibitory RNA in that vector. So that just turns the gene off with the vector. Next. Uh, and that works. And these are data that um, Erica Ezrick presented at ASH, uh, another study looking at gene transfer to turn on fetal hemoglobin by this one way. Next. Uh, they had 12 patients initially, again, similar um, patients, mostly with pain, mostly adult. Next. 
they had stable vector copy number and this time it showed up. <laughs> uh, it's around one, but there is one patient who's quite a bit lower as shown in blue here than the rest. Next. And here you can see fetal hemoglobin levels are around 30% in the, in the top left panel. Uh, with the exception of that one patient that I said had a low vector copy number where it's only about 10%. And that patient uh, continues uh, to have pain as they did uh, before. But these other patients have had improvements in their pain. Next. This is about 30% of hemoglobin coming from fetal and now 60 to 70% uh, percent, um, sickle. So this, this is, you know, a, a really good proof of concept, but I see this as, as a little less than um, less robust in terms of the overall percentage. And you can see the hemoglobins are, you know, 10 and a half, not 12. But this, this, you know, this approach is really, really quite good. And I think they're making improvements now to improve a vector copy number to hopefully get most of these patients over the 30% mark. Next. And you can see the pre and post uh, pain events. There are a few um, uh, in these patients, including the one patient where uh, there was insufficient vector copy number. Next. Again, this looked like, you know, a standard bone marrow transplant. There were no clonal events or anything like that. Um, and one patient had a pathogenic mutation that we're all obsessed with measuring now, but they had that um, before the transplant too. So we don't think uh, the transplant had anything to do with it in, in this case. Next. So now, you know, these, these kind of HIV-based vectors have been established in a number of diseases as medicine. So there's a bunch of New England Journal publications here, severe combined immunodeficiency, you know, the boy in the bubble disease, um, adrenal leukodystrophy, which is a brain disorder, thalassemia, you name it, these things are coming online now and getting uh, FDA approved. Next. But now we have CRISPR editing, as I mentioned, and this is a report from Frank Gould and colleagues showing that we can CRISPR edit these bone marrow cells at that same spot I was telling you about, BCL11A, and make fetal turn on and do a transplant of those cells. Next. Here shows the hemoglobin fractions um, in, in the two first patients, and it's pretty remarkable. One is a thalassemia patient on the left, and the other is a, um, is a sickle cell patient on the right. And all of these dots in the bottom panel uh, shown in blue are transfusions, okay? And you can see their hemoglobin A transfusions as shown in green but it switches to blue, which is fetal hemoglobin. And in this patient, you can see nearly 100% of the hemoglobin is now fetal, and the hemoglobin is 14 untransfused. And this patient was dependent on transfusions uh, beforehand by all of these dots. And you can see no more dots afterwards at the bottom, no more transfusions. And a similar thing was seen in the sickle cell patient. Uh, but, but you know, since there is hemoglobin S left behind, there's both fetal and sickle hemoglobin, fetal in blue, sickle in purple, about 40% fetal, normalization of the hemoglobin again. Um, and now you can see red dots at the bottom uh, in the blue shaded area before the intervention. Those are pain events and, and the darker dots are transfusions. And you can see they go away uh, after, uh, after the infusion. So this was really exciting. And this study has now next um, been in a phase three uh, uh, format in both thalassemia, that's TDT, transfusion-dependent thalassemia, and severe sickle cell disease. Uh, and I'll show you some of the data they used to, to justify their FDA approval. Next. So um, there's a full analysis set of 35 patients and a primary efficacy set of uh, 17 patients. Uh, this is shorter follow-up. If you look at the bottom, 11 months in the full set and 19 months in the primary efficacy set. But everything else looks very similar, mostly adults, mostly with severe pain episodes, uh, similar you know, drug product cell numbers and everything, and a very similar approach. You know, Do the intervention, freeze the cells, bring the patient back, give them busulfan, give the cells back, have them recover, 
and hope that you have enough fetal hemoglobin uh, to make the patient better. Next. So here again, we see the, the primary outcome measure, they call this VF12, being free of vaso-occlusive events for 12 consecutive months was achieved uh, in the majority uh, of the patients. And uh, 15 of the 16 participants remained uh, VOC free uh, during their follow-up. Next. Uh, now, instead of measuring vector copy number, we can measure the percentage of cells that have that gene broken that, re that holds back fetal hemoglobin and therefore allows fetal hemoglobin to turn back on. So that's shown in the top left. It's most of the cells, around about 75%. Um, and you can see um, editing in different fractions uh, and in bone marrow cells as well. So the editing worked. You know, most of the cells got that gene cut. Next. Here's the percent fetal hemoglobin. So you see it's a really nice total percent, 40%. And 95% of cells have that fetal hemoglobin inside of them. So that means nearly all of the cells have a hemoglobin that will protect against sickling. Next. This looks again the same as the last two. You know, most of the side effects are because we have to use busulfan. We can talk about whether we can ever get away from that. But at the moment, that's what we're stuck with. And, um, and these are all the side effects that we're very unfortunately familiar with. Um, busulfan is a tough drug. It causes the cells to drop. People get fevers, um, mouth sores, nausea, vomiting, belly pain, that sort of thing. Um, but these are expected. Next. Uh, I can really skip this. We have new ways of doing editing now that I think are like even better. We have this um, field just exploding with enthusiasm and with new ways to do this, which I think will not be so tough on the cell. And in this case, instead of breaking a gene, this is kind of like a find and replace on your word processor. You, you know, you have somewhere uh, a C, um, you know, you can you can change it um, uh, to an A <laughs> if you got a C, right? Who wouldn't want an A when they got a C? Anyway, you can just make these changes um, nearly at will. There's some restrictions, but it's a really a great new way of doing things. Next. So there's now a, a, an investigational therapy uh, study that's opened. It's called the BEAM 101. It's another way of making fetal hemoglobin turn on with this newer kind of technology. Uh, so that, you know, if you, you know, I've told patients that they may be able to find a site that's doing this, that they could participate in a, in a research protocol that's, you know, that's, um, that's doing something that's, you know, very likely to be similar to what we've seen before. Or now we have these FDA approved, you know, you could go for the ones that are approved and get, you know, get insurance or Medicaid, um, to cover it next. So I think we can cure the disease. We know we can do it with an aloe transplant. Now gene addition or gene editing gene therapy uh, look pretty similar short term. Uh, we need to do better uh, um, with the toxicities from the conditioning, especially busulfan. Hopefully we'll be able to develop novel conditioning regimens where we use antibodies or something like that. And I'm really hopeful that we can make the genetic tools um, uh, uh, in a way that we can just squirt them in the vein and have them do the work and you know, make it an outpatient procedure and not only reach patients in the US that, you know, that no doubt will have difficulty accessing these highly technical and expensive uh, forms of gene therapy that we have currently, but also in, in parts of the world where the disease is is more prevalent and the resources are more limited. So with that, I'll just flash the uh, next slide with the with the um, with the folks that help do all the work and uh, thank all the patients that have been participants um, teaching us over the years uh, what we needed to do to 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 make this happen. So.
Thank you, Dr. Tisdale. That was an amazing presentation. And guys, like full disclosure, Dr. Tisdale did not want to present. He just wanted to come on here and talk to you guys. But I felt like I wanted to see that presentation because I saw it at Ash and it blew me away. So I wanted you guys to see it too. Um, but now, Dr. Tisdale, we can back up and we can get into the conversation that you wanted to have. So um, I want to take us back. What year did you actually start working on this genetic care? Uh, so I started um, in 1995 in the lab. Mm -hmm. And at that time, you know, it looked like uh, this should work, right? We know, we know the mutation, the cause of the disease. It's the same in everybody. We can take the organ out and manipulate it and give it back as a transplant. So I was like, we should be able to do this. Right. And I felt like naively, but also partly true probably, is that why, why isn't anyone doing this? What the heck? Yeah. You know? And so, yeah, partly people weren't doing it because they were getting more funding to do other things. Mm -hmm. uh, but also partly people weren't, weren't, weren't succeeding because it turned out to be hard. Mm. A lot harder than what I thought. You know, the first studies that we did in the in the early '90s, where we were just using vectors to put genes in cells and patients who were getting a transplant for something else, we could get 50% of the cells that we put into the patient with the gene. But when they recovered, it was like one in a million. And so, one in a million is nowhere near enough to um, to fix sickle cell disease. So we worked for at least a decade trying to improve on that one in a million to get it to 20% so we could start thinking about the next steps. Okay, we can get 20%. Now, how do we make these vectors make hemoglobin? Because that's also complicated. Yeah. So what was kind of like a day in the life over these decades? Like you mentioned all this trial and error. So you would wake up, go to the lab, walk us through that. Yeah, so, I mean, it's really fun to give a talk um, and to show all the stuff that worked, uh, which is what I just did. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, sometimes I like, I show this one slide where we were trying to ask the question, if we put a gene into bone marrow cells, um, how many bone marrow cells will make blood and will they make blood for the life uh, of the animal? And we had this way of like tracking cells and and seeing how many they were, there were and how often they contributed and this, that, and the other. Um, and it took us two years to make one slide. <laughs> I didn't show that slide today, but one slide took us two years to answer that one question. And most of the time it's because, you know, when we're in the lab, uh, we're mostly doing troubleshooting. Something didn't work, some vector didn't work. We added something that we thought was gonna make it better. It made it worse. We figured out why we did something else. So, you know, a day in the life is that you come to the lab and most things don't work. Um, and we have fun, you know, talking about the data that we get, um, pushing each other to think about different reasons for what we got, trying to come back the next day and do it better uh, and, and, and make advances. But, you know, these big, these big aha moments like the, the, the vector finally working, you know, those are once every five or so years, you know, and the rest of it is, you know, sort of like brick building, right? I like to think of it as brick building, just, you know, you just lay in one brick after the other. And um, for me, that's, that's most of it, right? You, you go to work every day and you lay bricks every day. Before long, when you come back, there's a big old building in front of you. And you even wonder yourself how it got there, right? Wow. But it's that daily bricklaying that, um, that, that, you know, finally got us to where we are and that we have to continue to do to make it easier, uh, less cumbersome, um, less toxic, or less expensive, yeah. more accessible, those things. Yeah, so let's let's talk about the vector a little bit because I remember when the 60 minute special came out and um, you and Dr. Collins, you were talking about this HIV vector. And um, 
I'm gonna be honest, like I was one of the people who didn't even understand what a vector was. And my first question was like, why did they choose <laughs> HIV? So I want you to talk to us a little bit about why the HIV vector in particular and um, what you say to people who are nervous about using that particular vector. Yeah, I mean, um, it's it's uh, it's a little bit crazy sounding, right? That you're gonna do what? You're gonna give me HIV to get rid of my sickle cell disease? No thanks. Yeah. So I've, I've heard about that story before, you know? Right? right? So, um, but, but we have been, so to make, to put a gene into the cell, you need whatever you choose to do that to stick itself permanently into the DNA of that cell, mm -hmm. right? Not just exist outside of the nucleus, but go in the nucleus, get into the DNA permanently. And there are a lot of viruses out there that we could envision using to transfer genes but they're not that many that as a part of what they do, they stick themselves permanently into our DNA, except okay. retroviruses. <clears throat> so retroviruses are a kind of virus that exist as RNA and then copy themselves and stick themselves into our DNA as, as a part of their life cycle. And the vectors that we've been using for many, many years are... Um, retroviruses that that um, infect mice mm -hmm. and so we first used those and we first tested those in humans and they're pretty efficient for doing this but there were two problems one is that um, they don't um, get into cells unless they're dividing yeah and bone marrow stem cells are really quiet they don't normally divide so those cells don't get in uh, those viruses don't get in and insert themselves. So we have to make the cells divide. And when we made them divide, they were less efficient and in grafting. So that we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot by cranking them up because then they weren't stem cells anymore. And also these, um, these mouse uh, retroviruses wouldn't carry the beta globin gene and the stuff that we have to put in with it to make it turn on only in the red cell. So we don't want hemoglobin being made in all blood cells and right. all blood cells come from the stem cell. So you'd have hemoglobin in your white blood cells, which would be, you know, weird and probably um, deleterious, you know. So so this, this retroviral vector that we were using didn't work that well, mostly because it doesn't get into the bone marrow stem cell. Okay. And then this guy Luigi Naldini in Italy, he's a... Um, as a you know a guy who's been in the field for a long time discovered that vectors based on HIV can get into non-dividing cells so they go into stem cells they can even go into brain cells that don't divide and the second big thing about using the backbone of HIV not all the infectious parts just the backbone that inserts itself was that we could package all this complicated stuff in there that we needed to make hemoglobin and to have it turn on at the right time and the, and the vector would still work. So that's how we landed on HIV was purely, you know, from, from the science, but you know, it's, um, and, it, and it works great and it works great in many other diseases as you see, but especially for the hemoglobin diseases, because that's a much harder nut to crack um, than, you know, some of the things like you know, the boring the bubble disease, you don't need that much of the protein that's missing to fix it. To fix sickle cell disease, you need a whole bunch of hemoglobin uh, okay. to outcompete the sickle hemoglobin. So uh, it's because it, it works, you know, it works much better. But there's no chance that you will get HIV, right? Right. It's not, it's made in a way that all of the things that HIV uses to, to reproduce itself are gone. Okay. So we, we call that replication incompetent. It can't remake itself because all of those bits have been cut out and they've been separated. And this, the parts that have been replaced are hemoglobin, you know, and, and, and things that turn on the hemoglobin when the red cell is growing up in the bone marrow.
That's helpful. I've never quite heard it explained like that. Um, okay, so we're getting a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, which protocol, editing or addition, has been more successful in lowering your sickle hemoglobin? They look virtually identical. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, they look identical. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I have, well, you know, I, 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 I participated in the gene addition and, you know, I've seen all the data and actually they shared the data that I showed you uh, with the gene editing and it, you know, I can't find a difference, honestly. Uh, so they look pretty equivalent. You know, there's longer follow-up for the gene addition. We know a lot more about viral vectors and HIV. We have years and years of experience. We don't have as much experience uh, with um, gene editing, but um, in terms of what happens afterwards to the hemoglobin, the sickle hemoglobin, all of that, it looks it looks the same. Okay. Um, somebody wanted to know, have you ever seen a case where a swab test will come back with a false positive for HIV, having this vector? So there are tests for HIV. If So there's a way to check for HIV now. It's called nucleic acid testing, where they'll do um, amplification of the, um, you know, the gene. If they pick a spot that's also in the vector, then yes, it will be positive. That's like vector copy number. Uh, um, but, but the traditional antibody test, you know, where you, yeah, um, wh where you're screened will not be. And we've, you know, we've had to uh, counsel our patients on that that have gotten vector. If they do nucleic acid testing and they're using a test that, you know, is, you know, looks for part of the vector, then yes, it will be positive. Okay, that's good to know. It's a false positive, but yes, it will be positive. All right. Um, wow, so I just have so many questions. I don't even know where to start. Um, I think that the community is pretty excited, but a little bit skeptical. Some are kind of overwhelmed with this decision-making process. And so, like I said earlier, you and I got close when I was going through my own transplant. You got a frantic call from my mother. And we have a lot of frantic mothers in the community. And so I'm wondering, what do you say to a mother who's trying to determine if they should pursue a curative therapy? The first thing I always say is to do the best you can to manage the disease with the drugs that we have. And the reason why I say that is because so often um, patients have not had a good course of what I think of is the best drug for sickle cell disease, and that is hydroxyurea. Yeah. So many patients have tried it, and they were on it for a month or two, and they didn't like the way they felt, and they didn't feel like they were any better, and so they quit. But it takes a while for, for hydroxyurea to work. Yeah. It works by reactivating fetal hemoglobin. So I always ask patients, hey, what was your fetal hemoglobin when you were on hydroxyurea? And they're like, uh, what's that? Right. I said, okay, that's like going to the blood pressure clinic and not knowing what your blood pressure is. You know, mm -hmm. if you have high blood pressure, most people will tell you what their last blood pressure was when they went to the clinic. So they need to know what their fetal hemoglobin is because that's what we're trying to raise with the drug. And it takes six months to, to get it there. And you have to push the dose uh, to the point of getting the white cell count down to normal because it's always elevated in sickle cell disease. Yeah. And fetal you know, hemoglobin is high as you can get. So please optimize what you can while you're scratching your head so you don't have to feel like you're in a hurry because things are happening so quickly you know organs are being damaged pain is frequent hospitalizations are frequent hydroxyurea can help take the load off uh, and give you some breathing space and preserve organ function so that you know if a parent is not ready to make that decision the kid, once they're an adult, uh, can make the decision with intact organ function. Yeah. Okay. So, are you saying that, like, somebody, if somebody came to you with their toddler and they were just ready to cure this disease, your advice would be to first start hydroxyurea? Yes. 
Okay. Especially so, a toddler, because the yeah. results with hydroxyurea in toddlers is really extraordinary. I mean, the fetal hemoglobins go out the roof. So this is what's really interesting because like when you're talking about the oncology space, right? And we're talking about bone marrow transplants, it's usually like life or death, they have to do it. So how do you, how do you navigate? Like, how do you know when it's time to be pursuing a genetic cure? So uh, the, the problem with the genetic cure at the moment is busulfan. Right. And the fact that you have to get a transplant and therefore sign up for all of the side effects of a transplant. Most parents are reluctant to make that decision because that means that their kid is not going to be able to have a kid exactly. on their own. Yeah. And it's a really hard decision for a parent to make when, when you don't know what the child is going to want. I mean, let's face it, most people do want to have kids, right? So it's, it's, it's taking that, you know, prospect uh, out of the equation. Well, now we can do, you know, fertility preservation by... Uh, you know, freezing eggs, freezing sperm. Um, and, you know, that that helps. It doesn't guarantee uh, that, the, that the person will later be able to have a child. But that's, that's a hard decision. So you have to, you know, you have to weigh like, okay, so am I going to do this right now with my kid who could be doing really well on hydroxyurea uh, and wait around, you know, maybe, maybe it's going to be better Maybe the next protocol is going to be better. Maybe there are going to be ways to do conditioning that aren't so toxic um, versus, you know, I mean, the other side of the coin is that kids tolerate things right. well because, you know, they they don't have built up organ damage. They tend to be tougher anyway uh, than than adults for these kinds of things. So, you know, it's, a, it's probably a better shot uh, to to get it early when, you know, you remember when we were looking at transplant outcomes uh, in the bone marrow transplant registry data, what we found was that if you're gonna get a transplant from a matched sibling with sickle cell disease, the best results are six or younger. Mm. I mean, they're like, you you, you know, 99% cure rates with not much in the way of toxicity. So. You know, may wind up being true for gene therapy too. That the earlier you do it, the better. Yeah. But it's a decision that has to be made with all of these things in mind. You know, are they going to be able to have good care? Do they have a good response to hydroxyurea? Is the fetal hemoglobin high? Are they now out of pain and growing? You know, at a normal rate uh, compared to their uh, their peers. Those kinds of things. And if that's the case, in I think you can sit back for a little bit. On the other hand, you mm -hmm. know, if they have, you know, risk for stroke, having pain in the hospital over and over, hydroxyurea is not helping, then you have to think about whether this makes sense. Okay, right. I'm really glad you said that because I do want to acknowledge that we have Bernisha in the virtual audience and she did. She has a very young child um, who is they're kind of in the decision-making process and her child did not have a good response to hydroxyurea. So I do want to acknowledge that we know yeah, that not everyone responds, you know, right. that's, um, but, uh, you know, but again, if it hasn't been tried properly, I, I always um, try properly. And we think it's also helpful as a way to get ready for a regular transplant to be on hydroxyurea and cool things down yeah so for a regular allot transplant we always put people on hydrea and push it before the transplant right and i think that's an important point because i think a lot of times we think about like disease modifying therapy or genetic care but you kind of need disease modifying therapy to preserve you for a cure and so right I think that's also an important point um Wow. So, okay. Another question, like as a mother, if I came to you and I said, I'm trying to decide between an unmatched um, allogenic like transplant or gene therapy, as someone who's been on like behind the scenes working on both, 
what would you say? So um, for an unmatched, I would say go with gene therapy. Um, with an unmatched or a matched unrelated donor, uh, the results just don't seem as good as the gene therapy approaches. However, um, the Vanderbilt group just presented data at ASH uh, about uh, half-matched transplants. Yeah. And, um, you know, with a few tweaks in the regimen, it looks a lot better. Okay. Um, with, you know, 90% of kids with good engraftment and low rates of graft versus host disease. And I think 100% of adults um, with engraftment and low rates of graft versus host disease. So this is, you know, this is where we need to now focus on this or that. I think that this or that is, is match uh, um, haplo transplant versus uh, gene therapy. Uh, you know, there are benefits to both. I mean, so gene therapy, there's no graft versus host disease. Um, if it doesn't work, you can get a haplo after, you know? Yeah. Um, and, um, but it's expensive and, um, you know, in its, in its infancy uh, compared to transplant in general, though haplo is also in its infancy. Haplo, you know, it's cheaper. Um, it works most of the time. I think the results are similar to gene therapy. Um, it's easier to schedule, you know. Um, most people have a haplo donor, um, but if it if it fails, you can't go get gene therapy afterwards. Yeah, you know, I was gonna ask you about that next. Um, but it's so funny that you said that because I do. I remember being at Ash and looking at the latest protocol from the haplo trials and it was so much better than when i did it and i remember yeah. sitting next yeah. to vivian sheehan and she was like i am so sorry like that um you didn't wait and that's definitely how i was feeling but i think it's just an important point to point out because a lot of times i tell my story and people get a little freaked out but that was 13 years ago and science has come such a long way since then so i just want to make sure that i say that um but yeah, I am um, because I actually get a lot of calls from people who have had bone marrow transplants and rejected, wondering if they're eligible for gene therapy. We've, and we are not. We've, we've tried to harvest um, bone marrow stem cells after a failed transplant, and it's just just so few that there wouldn't be enough for. Oh, because of the chemotherapy, right? Like depleted. Right, it's been depleted by a lot. So, um, do you ever see a resolve to that? Like, is there ever going to be a time that I, if I wanted to, could sign up for gene therapy? Oh, uh, there may be. Yeah, I, I mean, stem cells should regenerate over time. Okay. So. Okay. But, so but it's also possible, and and I, I want to be sure to mention that if you reject a haplo transplant, uh, you can try again with the opposite half. So you match okay. half, right, with your donor. The half that you match and reject, you would think, okay, I don't want to try that one again because I've already rejected. But you can try the other half and yeah. potentially um, potentially have it succeed. And I have seen that work. Yeah, this is a conversation that Dr. Tisdale and I have offline quite a bit, you guys. So I don't know. I'll keep you posted about that. Uh, is overt stroke still within the inclusion criteria at the NIH trial? So for um, for our transplant trials with a brother or sister or a half match, yes. Um, we don't have a currently open gene therapy trial because the the you know, the FDA approved it and we only do research here. So now those things can be done at centers that have, um, you know, that have signed up to do it. I think they're allowing uh, stroke as an indication, though on the trial, okay. uh, they didn't. And what about organ damage? If you have a little bit of organ damage, can you still pursue gene therapy? Yeah, it depends on the extent. Um, so you need to have a, you know, 
mostly normal liver, kidney, heart, lung. But um, the um, I think most patients are within the uh, inclusion criteria. Um, it has to be, you know, pretty bad to exclude you. Um, okay. On our matched donor transplants, because it's uh, no chemotherapy, you know, we'll take, you know, just about any degree of organ damage. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, is there an age cutoff? So there was an age cutoff on the trials, um, but not on the FDA approved products, except okay. that um, there's a lower limit of 12. Okay. There's not an upper limit. And we don't have upper limit on our alloy transplant protocols. Okay. And um, does Gina does the gene addition protocol wipe involve full T cell ablation? So there's no T cell ablation in any of the gene therapy protocols. So busulfan doesn't do much to T cells. So for example, immunity um, is pretty preserved, like vaccine immunity and that sort of thing is pretty preserved. We do have a um, um, a habit of revaccinating people uh, in the year <laughs> after transplant. Yeah. Um, but you know the 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 T cells aren't really bothered much by busulfan. And I don't really understand that because if I rejected, why did I have to get revaccinated? Because you had cyclophosphamide too, and you had a lot of it. Um, so, so, you know, the first transplants and the first for sickle cell disease used busulfan right. and cyclophosphamide. Busulfan is to knock out all the bone marrow stem cells. Mm -hmm. and cyclophosphamide is to knock out all the immune cells like lymphocytes. So that way you have, you know, you've tilled the garden to plant your seeds, that's the busulfan, and you've knocked out the um, immune system that could possibly reject those seeds with cyclophosphamide. And so a big, you know, a big dose of cyclophosphamide like you got um, will knock out the immune system. Are they still using, they don't use cycle, they don't use that anymore at all in haplos anymore, right? They use exactly what you got with two tweaks only. And it's the beauty of, of sweating the details. And I say this mm -hmm. all the time, you know, the details, matter. So yeah. you got 200 um, rads of radiation and you got like um, cyclosporin MMF, I think. Yes, I did. And um, post-graph cyclophosphamide. Um, you got ATG and fludarabine beforehand and a little bit of cyclophosphamide beforehand. That's all the same. What they did was they changed 200 to 400 rads, which doesn't feel that different to the patient, but clears more space in the marrow and is more immunosuppressive and also uh, switched to serolimus, a different kind of um, immunosuppressive that can, that's better at making cells tolerate one another. Oh. And those are the two things they did, that's it. Wow, that made a huge, <laughs> made a huge difference. And the Vanderbilt group instead added a chemotherapy called Thiotipa uh, right at the beginning and they're getting similar results. So these little tweaks made a big difference. That's amazing that you can hold all of that in your brain, because um, I don't even remember all of that. But when you said it, yes, it came back to me. But while you've been working on yeah, well, the gene therapy, all I do, you don't right? know all the stuff about bone marrow transplants just off the top of your head. That's really amazing to me. Um, and then the last thing that I want to talk about before I ask you this last question is you addressed it in your presentation that sometimes you do see these exceptions of people that will still have pain. Yeah. And I know people who have also had like bone marrow transplants, not a lot, but they still have pain. So what do you attribute that to? So I think that, and I'm not a pain expert, so I'm just, you know, yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering out loud that um, that the brain, when you've had pain all your life, mm -hmm. is wired for pain efficiently. And that even painful stimuli that that aren't sickle pain get interpreted in your in your brain as that because that's how the brain has now become wired. 
and it's a it's like a chronic pain syndrome that anything can tweak and probably you've had this happen where you had a like a bone marrow biopsy right and normally that's just a little bit of pain and, and that's it and i've had them myself i've volunteered when i was a resident because they would give me 150 bucks <laughs> and it wasn't that bad right but for you it is because it you know it tickles this part of your brain that's like really good at interpreting pain so you know, the pain of a bone marrow biopsy can turn into it feeling like full-blown sickle cell pain. Yeah. I think that can persist for a very long time. And the only way to, 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 to get rid of that is to break that cycle by not having any more pain. So, you know, um, one way to do that is to do a transplant and make the sickle cells go away and have normal red cells and you don't have any more crisis pain you don't have that chronic pain but if you have you know the ravages of this disease having caused you know osteonecrosis of multiple joints you have you know bone pain that persists that is a constant again reminder of the brain that you're having this event and it can't unwire like it could otherwise if you had no pain so we you know, when we see patients that just have intermittent pain and are mm -hmm. out of the hospital in between with zero pain, mm -hmm. that patient gets a transplant and the transplant is successful, they wind up with zero pain. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, so Bernicia came to this webinar like more prepared than even I did. And I don't even know how to address this question or read it. So I'm going to put it on the screen so you can see it. So what about a Batacept? Is that going to be used in gene therapy protocols? I think, Bernie, that it's going to be used in um, transplant protocols where you get somebody else's bone marrow, like haplotransplants, because it's a good drug to suppress the immune system and to keep it from rejecting, like, you know, like we know about here. Um, but, but also help the cells once they get in to not cause graft versus host disease. So it's a it's a really good drug for that. And that's where I think it's gonna be used. We don't really need it in a gene therapy protocol because yeah. you're getting your own cells back. So you don't need to worry so much about the immune system, but it's a great drug. Um, Dr. Fitzhugh here at, at the clinical center is using it in her most recent iteration of, uh, of haplotransplant. Okay, so it is an immunosuppressant. Yes. Got you. Okay, um, you talked a little bit about this and we've talked offline about this quite a bit that you do foresee a day when we'll be able to do this without chemotherapy. Yes. And a monoclonal antibody. Yes. So there are currently two ways of thinking about this. One is that we can make an antibody to something that's only on bone marrow stem cells. So the seeds of the marrow clear out the seeds and then put new ones in that we've fixed. And so we've done that using a monoclonal antibody that was developed by this company, Magenta. Right. Uh, they were moving into clinical trials. It works by um, having a drug hooked to the antibody. And we can use antibodies for a lot of stuff. Like you remember at the beginning of COVID, Regeneron, this company made these antibodies to COVID yeah. Uh, and you, and if you got exposed, if you got them early, uh, you could have the disease turned around in its tracks. Like, like um, when Trump got uh, COVID, he got this antibody, and he was better the next day. Yeah. And uh, so that kind of thing can be made not just for viruses, but for cells in the bone marrow. And so this one that we've used. Uh, can knock the bone marrow out completely and not knock anything else out. So that's a huge step because chemotherapy works in a kind of a primitive way, right? Mm -hmm. It's a poison that gets taken up by cells that are growing quickly. So, you know, cancer is a, is a kind of thing that grows quickly. So if you give a poison, most of the poison will be taken up by the cancer and you can kill the cancer. And, you know, you try to give as much as you can without harming the patient. Yeah. Right? So we do the same thing with busulfan.
we give as much as we can to knock the bone marrow out, but we knock the GI tract out. We knock the m- m- lining of the mouth out. We, we knock the hair follicles out. You know, we knock cells out in the liver. So we see all these toxicities because it's not specific. You know, mm-hmm. antibody we can make specific to a bone marrow stem cell and then tag to it a drug that kills those cells and kill those cells only. And so, you know, we had that working in small animals and large animals where normally, you know, if it works in a large animal, it works in a human. And I know you know this, but it's worth repeating that the the most recent set of studies that we did, we saw pregnancies after transplant with this antibody. Right, right. So that's what's really exciting to me. So basically, there will be a day when we can pursue this cure, keep our hair and our fertility. That's amazing. How far out do you think we are from that? So, you know, the, unfortunately, the, the company um, was one of these startup biotech companies, and they just didn't survive the, um, the tough times of the pandemic and not being mm-hmm. able to raise money and what have you. Uh, but the technology still exists, and I know there are other companies with interest um, in developing this. And so I'm hopeful that, you know, one of these ones that's already out there, you know, Bluebird or CRISPR Vertex, will will make us their next step, testing, um, you know, an antibody approach. Uh, now that they have approved the gene therapy approach, right? It's hard to do both at once. But now that the gene therapy of theirs is already approved, they can now make an experimental um, FDA regulated approach looking at whether an antibody can be used instead of a, um, you know, a chemotherapy drug. So, you know, I would say in the next few years, um, we'll see it, we'll see it launched. It was already in humans when the, when the um, company uh, decided to fold up. Wow. Well, I'm not going to call out any names, but on the registration, I saw a couple of people associated with some larger pharmaceutical companies not yet in the sickle cell space. So maybe after this, you'll start getting some phone calls. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think I asked everything um, from an emotional standpoint, though. This is something that you've been working on for a very long time. So the day that you found out these therapies were approved, what did you do? What was your reaction? I mean, I almost fell over. My my cell phone was blown up, of course. So I was mostly uh, responding uh, to all of that. But um, I, I, I called Roderick Murray's wife. That's what I did to make sure she knew. Because he was the first patient to, to to do this, yeah, and um, and he knew being the first person to go on a gene therapy protocol meant that the likelihood of it working was a lot less than the ones that would come after him. Yeah, so he had to do it, and he was doing it for those after him. Yeah, uh, and for those of you that don't know, Roderick was. Just an incredible, incredible, incredible soul. Um, and I remember hearing him say that one of the first things he did was like he went to the beach and just just like lived his life in a way that he wasn't able to. So what year was that when he first got the gene therapy? Uh, he, he came to us in 2014. And that was the HIV vector. Yes, he was the first person to get gene therapy in the U.S. Yes, I'm glad that you brought him up because um, I definitely thought about him. And I remember when he passed away, like <laughs> I remember calling you and um, I just know how much he meant to you. And so just as a community, um, we owe him so much we do. We and you so much. And so, um, yeah, I what are I'm actually going to let you have the final word. Um, any closing messages for the community? Well, I mean, for me, it's a, it's, it's, it's been quite a journey, you know, to be in the space where, you know, I mean, when I first started, patients were basically ignored, right? Just getting them in, get them out, give them as little pain medicine as you 
possibly can. I mean, that's that's what I heard people saying, you know. And yeah. but it came it became quick quickly clear to me that 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 people were coming in the hospital because they were in a lot of pain. And and at that point, that's all we had was pain medicine. So I always did my best to make sure I at least, you know, I can't fix the sickle cell disease, but I can definitely make the pain, if not go away, way better with the medicines that we have. And and to now be to the point where we can actually make the disease go away and 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 get rid of the pain medications and have a life started that was always stuttering with stops and starts. I mean, it's it's really extraordinary. But but there's so much left to do now, right? We have to solve this issue of the yeah. of the infertility. We have to get beyond chemotherapy. We have to get beyond transplants in general. We have to get to you know affordable um, ways to do this. We and and we have to get to the point where we have something in a syringe where we can just fix this, you know. So. Um, I mean, it's 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 been extraordinary to be able to be a part of making a difference, you know, in this disease, and and to be partnered, you know, closely with with patients in that effort has also been really extraordinary. But we gotta we gotta keep going. Okay, so to answer the question in the presentation, we are moving the needle. Yes. But you hope to move it even further. Yes. You got right. to keep moving the needle. That's perfect. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us. And um, this webinar, I know it was like a lot to digest. So it will be housed on our YouTube channel. You can rewatch it. You can share it. And again, we just thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next time. Yes. Thank you again for the opportunity.